Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today I'm going to be talking about Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars role-playing game, specifically the rules mechanics for um, duty, for obligation, duty, and morality. So obligation went with the Edge of the Empire, the, the Bounty Hunter game, and duty went with the Age of Rebellion, uh, kind of like the Princesses and Pilots game, and morality came with Force and Destiny, which is the... Um, the game that went with uh, the Jedi's, right? So, um, so I want to talk about these mechanics specifically, and uh, but it's going to take a little bit of a path to get there, right? So, um, first, I, I just want to talk. So, I've been really blessed to to have a just a wonderful, wonderful experience with the with the Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars role playing game. And the reason why I'm talking about uh, obligation, duty, and morality today is I watched a fantastic, um, a fantastic interview done today on the Saving Throw YouTube tabletop role-playing game uh, channel. And what they were talking about was they were talking about um, the specific, uh, actually, the the moderator from you know one of the people from Saving Throw. What, and I'm sorry I don't know his, his name. I've just started watching Saving Throw a little bit more, and I think there's multiple people on the channel. Um, but they did this great interview with Max Brooks from Fantasy Flight Games. And he is a designer for the Fantasy Flight uh, game, the, the Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars tabletop role-playing game and the Miniatures game for Armada and X-Wing. Now, I've played all those games except Armada. I haven't played Armada yet. Um, and he talked in depth about the Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars role playing game. It was a fantastic interview, but there was something really special in there. They talked about duty, obligation, and morality. They talked about it specifically. And so, what was really interesting was the saving throw moderator, the interviewer, he asked the question that I deeply cared about. He was like, Hey, I had a lot of trouble with these mechanics. Um, Explain them to me so that, you know, I'm sure it's just that I didn't get it, right? And, um, you know, and so it was really interesting him saying, you know, I didn't get this. And then, you know, and then Max Brook jumping in and he was like, well, you know, obligation is really easy for people to understand. Duty, there is no real, if you, you know, if you look in the movies... I think we'll understand duty once we've once Rogue One has been out, and morality morality is great for Jedi, but you know if you have all these players and characters in one group, well, what you could do is you could just put morality on a bounty hunter, and you could put obligation on, uh, you know, a a rebel pilot, and you could just throw them around, right? And so I felt like, okay, this is this is a game, you know, this is a guy who knows this stuff backwards and forwards, and, um, you know, and he doesn't have a sound answer for this, right? Which was telling me that this is absolutely a design problem, right? So, um, and, and I think it was. So the reason why I was so fascinated by this is I ran that, I ran a Edge of the Empire, Age of Rebellion, Force and Destiny game for Nerdarchy. Uh, for Nerdarchy.com, uh, we had, you know, four or five characters, four or five player characters. We had players from every single book, and we had player characters that had content from multiple books, right? And now, I was blessed to have a, a great Fantasy Flight Games journey. I got to play from the very beginning when the, when the, box, came, when the box set came out. So I want to be super clear. I'm, I'm bringing up a problem of this game, but this is like, uh, you know, this is, I kind of like, you know, um, I would say, you know, Uma Thurman's hair is dirty blonde and she's not taller. <laughs> you know, like this, uh, the best way to say this is, she, you know, Uma Thurman, in my opinion, is, is an incredibly beautiful woman, right? But there are minor imperfections and that's what I'm saying here. The the uh, you know the duty the obligation and the um, uh, and the role and the duty the obligation and the uh, duty obligation and what's the and morality they're in there right 
but it, it's a significant issue in the game, right? And they don't really mix. And, it, and, and when you're trying to move story tracks for somebody who has obligation, for somebody who has duty, and somebody who has morality, it, it was a hard time for me to explain to my players. And I kept trying week after week to figure it out. And now I know it wasn't me missing it. It was, the, you know, a guy who works for the company could not really explain and also said that duty had no actual correlation to the films, right? You know, so it was really, you know, it was really fascinating to hear that, right? And so it was just kind of acknowledgement of this is an area where this game was not able to land everything they tried to do. And my takeaway for this is that game, you know, so what, what is the real, so what, all right, I'm calling out, it, it really, <laughs> so I watched Duma Thurman in a lot of films when I was young, and, uh, you know, to me, she is the quintessential movie star, right, and so what I'm saying is, you know, and she was versatile, and, you know, and to this day, I really feel like she's a really special movie star, and she... You know, and so, what's the best way to say this? So, I really want to talk about the, you know, this this kind of lacuna within the, the Star Wars tabletop role playing game. They, you know, what did the Star Wars tabletop role playing game accomplish, and what did it fail at? Right? What accomplished is historical. Right? The Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars tabletop role playing game is absolutely a historical event. Right? And when I say the role-playing game, I mean all three of the core rule books. So they, they really broke the model for, uh, just like Uma Thurman, I think, really kind of broke the model for a movie actor, for a movie actor, in that, you know, she was in Pulp Fiction, and she was in Baron Munchausen, and um, you know, she was in, you know, she showed so much range and was able to do so many things that she's an historically important actress, right? The same is exactly true with Fantasy Flight Games tabletop role-playing game, and that is that that game did some th some things that no other game had ever done. Right? One, the idea of core rule books, um, all coming you know take the entire world and split it into three core rule books. It has never been done before. It it changed the market from a. So in my opinion. I could be wrong, but I would not be surprised to find out that Fantasy Flight Games, Star Wars tabletop role-playing game, is the most successful tabletop role-playing game in history, except for d and I think it's number two, right? And it's only like five, six years old. I think it's made more money. They, that Fantasy Flight Games has been cranking out the, you know, has been cranking out core rule books for it and source, rule, source books for it and box sets for it, and uh, and the narrative dice, the narrative dice, right? So I think commercially, they set a new bar. This game is really peerless in its position in, in tabletop role-playing game history, right? And what's really important is, they, here's, here's why, right? They just did a Fantasy Flight Games for, um, Force Awakens box set, right? That That is saying, you know, that Disney was saying, hey, you guys have finished this entire game. We could kill this license right now, right? Because, you know, it's done, right? But we're, we we want to do more with you guys, right? And actually, Max Brooks talked in that interview, and the, uh, the Saving Throw interviewer said, hey, when is the next source book coming out? When is the next core rule book? Are you doing a core rule book for... Um, for Force Awakens, and he's like, I cannot comment on that, right? So that tells me, right now, they are working to get that done, right? Uh, they're working to see if they can get that license from Disney. Now, why is this such a big deal, right? It's a big deal because of Marvel, the Marvel tabletop role-playing game, right? The Marvel tabletop role-playing game, like, multiple companies had that role-playing game, right? Uh, FASA had it for a little while, and then... At the end, and then it ba it bounced. It just it, it, there was at least two or three different. Oh, um, there was the Marvel Saga role playing game, and there was another version of the Marvel role playing game. So at least three that I can remember, and then finally there was a fourth. Maybe you know maybe it was the fifth or sixth edition, 
uh, there was Margaret Weissman's games, uh, Marvel tabletop role-playing game. Now, the thing that is stunning is that game came out right as the Marvel Cinematic Universe was being built. And that is the worst bobble of a licensed product that has ever happened in tabletop role-playing games. The Marvel tabletop role-playing, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a gigantic juggernaut. It is a multi-billion dollar property. And the game that was produced, I bought it and I read it and I really digged it. And it was a fantastic tabletop role-playing game if every single person at that table understood player agency 100% was a um, was a skilled thespian and was also a game master. Everybody at the table had to be all three of those things to get that game, to even understand it, and to play it, right? So the, t- the, the, the problem was not only was the, were the rules complex, but they were so innovative that the standard player, it was very hard for them to get a, ga- a grasp of it. The Star Wars tabletop role-playing game brought in new innovation. The narrative dice in the Star in the Fantasy Flight games, t- Star Wars tabletop role-playing game, there is no dice mechanic in any game like it. Those custom dice allow storytelling at a level in the Star Wars uh, Fantasy Flight games t- tabletop role-playing game that's never been seen in any tabletop role-playing game. So while they did something amazingly innovative, they made it accessible and highly accessible and tons of people dig that game. And if you look on YouTube, YouTube is just filled with um, tabletop role-playing games of Star Wars that are being played. So they, you know, they realized the value of the property they had. They clutched it like a, like, you know, like a, like a swaddled child and just really, really carefully um, took a lot of care for it, right? So my point in bringing out this, this hole in it, like the duty, the obligation, and the um, morality, um, that's just one area where I feel like they didn't fully land that in the game, right? And the only reason I even bring it up was just, you know, I had had this issue with the game. I feel like that this issue was 100% confirmed by this other interview as a real legitimate concern with this game, right? But it's such a, but it, but, you know, it's a minor imperfection, you know, it's like, um, it's a, it's a super minor imperfection in what is really a, a historically important game. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting about the Fantasy Flight game, Star Wars tabletop role-playing game, are the narrative dice, right? So, um, I really feel that FFG, Star Wars tabletop role-playing game, is, is historically important because of the commercial success it's had, because of the multiple core rule books approach. Brilliant. It's one of the most brilliant marketing ideas and most flawless executions I've ever seen in tabletop role-playing game design. But one of the things that is really interesting about the the Star Wars tabletop role-playing game overall is just... um, Oh, the, the narrative dice themselves are fantastic. So... There, there are no numbers on the dice, it's all symbols, and it's custom, right? Which means you need to buy custom dice for this. We're fu- Now, for- fortunately, we are about to see, I will tell you right now, no one is going to complain about the custom dice in Star Wars tabletop role-playing games anymore because of Invisible Sun. Invisible Sun made over $600,000 on its Kickstarter. It is $197 tabletop role-playing game, Right? So there, you know, so I think finally Monty Cook has freed the industry from people whining about $15 dice sets, right? Which is really no big deal. I mean, buying a $15 dice set, dice sets were already $5 to $10, you know what I mean? And so, you know, it, it really, what it did make the game more expensive. It made it a little less accessible. It made it harder to play. But once you were over those minor hurdles... It really opened up, like, uh, if you get a chance, really um, listen to this interview with Max Brooks over on Saving Throw, because what he, what what the Saving Throw interviewer said is, hey, I have players who tell me what happens when a despair comes up on those dice, and he's absolutely right. The dice literally pull players to, to, to give ideas and to say, I think this is going to happen. 
and to really narratively grab them and just shake them by the shoulders. And I think that's so awesome. Now here's, here's the problem. <laughs> There's a problem with those narrative dice. The narrative dice are one of the biggest innovations in tabletop role-playing games. And one of the things that's interesting is that innovation has been tied to success of a licensed property. So I think if you if you had attached these narrative dice to any other tabletop role-playing game that didn't have the power of Star Wars behind it, it very well may have failed. In fact, if you, you know, it's not just me saying this, if you go back two, three years, there were major rumors and covered on multiple blog sites that the Ennies, there was like there was like a you know a star room talk where people go, we are not giving a, a an award to a game that requires custom dice. So this custom dice thing was a big deal in the tabletop role playing game industry. And only now, now there are three core rule books that are successful, that Fantasy Flight Games was able to hold on to that licensed property and finish the entire game, right? Finish all three. Um, you know, that and, and really even go so far as to maybe even do something that's never been done, which is, you know, go beyond the core characters and actually make tabletop role-playing games that are they're connected to individual films, right? After completing a cohesive whole, right? That's never been even accomplished. And the Marvel tabletop role-playing game showed how incredibly difficult this is and how and how high stakes this is. Like this is high, high stakes. There were a lot of people that were attached to the Marvel tabletop role-playing game. And, you know, and I will tell you right now, there, I guarantee there were some grown men who shed some tears over the, you know, over the, what happened with that game and the loss of that license, right? So, um, it, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So the narrative dice, I think they're the greatest innovation that has come into tabletop role-playing games within the last five years, right? And they are brilliant and really wonderful, and we need them detached from the Star Wars tabletop role-playing games so that we can start to play fantasy games with them, and we can play, you know, spy games with them, and we can play superhero games with narrative dice, and we can play all these other great types of tabletop role-playing games with these narrative dice, but you cannot do it, right? And the reason why is the FFG Star Wars tabletop role-playing game is a special snowflake, man. That is the goose that laid the golden egg. And so, you know, I don't think Fantasy Flight Games wants to say, hey, we built the greatest innovation in the entire industry for your game, and we want to detach it and make it available in other games. And Star Wars is going to go, whoa, you know, like, you know, why don't we just keep it just for our game? Uh, we don't need you, you know, spreading the wealth there, you know. And so, and, you know, they have an incredibly valuable property, and I think they want things to be unique to them. They want things to be special. And they also are saying, hey, you know, if you're going to spend $15 for your dice, that should be coming because you love the, the licensed property that it's connected with. And so the narrative dice are now trapped behind the the Star Wars tabletop role-playing game, right? And uh, and I'm not sure they're ever going to be released until, until Fantasy Flight Games loses that license uh, or... Um, until maybe there's bigger fish to fry on the Star Wars end, you know, maybe, but there's going to need to be a major, major change within tabletop role-playing games for them to, uh, bring that out. So, um, you know, uh, also, uh, quick note about Uma Thurman. I realize now having said that, that maybe that was a little genderist <laughs> to say, to talk about an imperfection in a, in a female <laughs> In a female uh, um, uh, star, there. I, my apologies if that was genderist in any way. Uh, there's lots of uh, also, you know, male um, male stars in there. Uh, that's not my particular thing. But if I did offend anybody with that, terribly sorry. Uh, just uh, you know, I was kind of remembering my uh, 15, 20, 25 year old days. And if I if that was if I went over the line there, my apologies uh, to Uma Thurman and to anybody that offended. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, you know, I do all these um, all these uh, videos right off the cuff, and so and I definitely try to understand that tabletop role playing games definitely have a lot of history with genderist issues, and I'm trying to make sure that you know when I talk about players and game masters and games, that I'm thinking about all the different people that play those games in every single uh, you know um, category, 
And so if that was genderist, my apologies. Thank you guys for your patience and have a great day.